Hello, my name is Hans, and I'm a hydrologist with the Arizona Department of Environmental Quality. This presentation provides background on research and development of a remote environmental monitor for communicating field conditions over the Internet of Things. A second presentation in development summarizes the year one test of the prototype that's described in this show. But first, a little more background about the problem we're trying to solve. When time allows, I support field operations for ADQ's Water Quality Division. This may involve long, hot hikes in dangerous conditions to remote locations on watersheds in southeastern Arizona. As part of our monitoring, we visit ephemeral washes for stormwater sampling. For most of the year, these washes are dry, but during the rainy season, they may flood. As such, they contribute flow to important rivers like the San Pedro in southern Arizona. For this reason, they can give us insight on sources of contaminants that may impact downstream water bodies. Given the ephemeral nature of runoff in Arizona, we install first flush samplers in these washes. These are essentially bottles encased in a plastic housing that's partially buried in the wash. When a runoff event occurs, our bottles capture a sample of that runoff and must later be retrieved for laboratory analysis. When planning our visits, we monitor rainfall conditions to increase the likelihood that bottles will contain a sample. On good days, we'll retrieve full bottles like this one. This sample will be analyzed to evaluate the effectiveness of best management practices being supported on the contributing watershed. However, we can't always be certain that runoff has occurred where our samplers are installed. Sometimes our visits yield dusty, empty bottles. For one area in the upper San Pedro River Basin, we conservatively estimate 84 hours were lost over the course of a year. That's 84 hours hiking in dangerous hot conditions, which isn't much fun for employees and certainly isn't time well spent. This presents us with a unique opportunity to see how we can improve field operations to realize more environmental good with our limited resources. Commercial hardware like cellular modems and auto samplers are viable alternatives for collecting stormwater. Such hardware can improve both the quality of the collected samples and also notify us via cellular networks that our sample is ready for collection. This is a reasonable solution for improving efficiency of field operations, but the associated cost can be high. For a cellular modem alone, we've received quotes of close to $2,300, not including a monthly subscription for cellular service. Auto samplers can add thousands more to the quote limiting our options should we wish to install multiple samplers on a tight budget. In response, I decided to see if anyone had developed an open source alternative to this commercial solution. Open source is a development model that promotes universal access and redistribution to a product's design or blueprint, including subsequent improvements by others. By licensing hardware's Creative Commons, it gives people the freedom to share and use knowledge without having to pay royalty fees thus lowering entry and deployment costs while also fostering innovation. Although I found nothing specific to my application, I did discover a hardware software platform known as Arduino. The heart of Arduino is a microcontroller very similar to those found in commercial auto samplers and modems offered by private companies. Since Arduino is licensed under Creative Commons, I can use it to invent, deploy, and share my inventions with others freely without paying any licensing fees. Arduino is an excellent platform for remote environmental monitoring because it gives me the ability to attach environmental sensors to socket headers. I can then write programs to respond to environmental conditions by engaging other hardware like motors, servos, or even cell phones. Arduinos themselves are relatively inexpensive. Official releases of Arduino can be purchased on Amazon for less than $20 and even less on eBay if you purchase a non-official release and have the patience to have your hardware shipped from overseas. In addition, compatible sensors for detecting things like temperature, pressure, presence, absence of flow, and many other environmental factors are available on eBay for pennies on the dollar. Granted, these are not gonna be considered EPA reference methods, but they're good enough for giving you qualitative information or for detecting an on-off condition in the field, which is perfect for my application. This opens up all kinds of opportunities for invention and deployment on a limited budget. So this led me to my next question. Can I build an open source alternative that addresses many of the same functions of a commercial alternative as advertised on their website? 
Well, excluding customer service, this slide basically summarizes what I'd hope to incorporate in, in my invention. And so on July 30th of 2015, I submitted a proposal to ADEQ requesting a small stipend to purchase hardware to develop an open source alternative. Using Arduino as the backbone of the system, this is the conceptual model developed for the prototype. Its principal components include a cell phone attached to an Arduino, which is hosting one or more environmental sensors. The system runs off a LiPo battery maintained by a small solar panel. And this is what the conceptual model looks like when it's mapped out on a breadboard. In this case, I'm using a 3-volt trinket, which is a low-power variant of an Arduino sold by Adafruit. I'm also using a Fona cellular modem also offered by Adafruit, which is a low-cost 2G cell phone that can talk to the Arduino. A solar LiPo battery charger and solar panel for keeping the charge on my battery in the field. And finally, a DHT22 temperature humidity sensor as an analog for collecting environmental data. I'll talk some more about these components in the following slides. And here's the actual setup, which includes an optional LCD to help me debug any programming errors. All the electronics needed to build this system can be purchased from US distributors for about $200, and for much less if you search from surrogates from Chinese manufacturers via Banggood or eBay. For those that are interested, I've included a link to a wish list on Adafruit's website, where you can learn more about the capabilities and costs of the components used in my first prototype. I should mention here that I'm not a programmer and I'm definitely not an electrical engineer. For this reason, I personally prefer to pay a little extra and purchase from reputable US dealers like Adafruit or SparkFun, since these companies provide excellent customer service, tutorials on how to use their hardware, and venues for feedback and continuous innovation. Were it not for the customer service forums hosted by Adafruit in particular, I would have never figured this stuff out simply by purchasing cheap hardware on eBay. The next step involved deciding what kind of enclosure I would need. Not being an electrical engineer, I wasn't aware of formal options like NEMA certified enclosures, so I started investigating waterproof enclosures used for other purposes. In doing so, I learned I would have to decide between a polycarbonate or a polypropylene enclosure. Polycarbonate is similar to the hard plastic used in mint boxes and polypropylene is the softer plastic used in the box lids. Each has its benefits and risks as outlined on this slide. Given that I was on a limited budget, I went with the polypropylene option shown here, which is essentially a kayaker's lunchbox and thus a good waterproof option. I also considered polypropylene since it was easier to drill holes into relative to polycarbonate with the equipment I had available at that time. To help improve the UV resistance, I applied a UV resistant clear coat to my box. I also considered painting my box white in order to improve the sunlight reflectance, but eventually decided against it in order to avoid drawing attention to the hardware once installed in the field. But this is an alternative for diminishing temperatures in a hot desert environment. And here are the electronics encased in the selected waterproof container. The solar LiPo charger was installed using brass standoffs, but you could just as easily attach everything with Velcro as was done with the breadboard shown here. Next, I needed to test the communication capabilities of this prototype. For cellular telemetry, the relatively inexpensive Adafruit Fona is essentially an Arduino-compatible cell phone. The Fona runs on the 2G network and will accept Ting SIMS, which is a T-Mobile reseller. Ting is great since it offers a pay-as-you-go service plan, which can be monitored and adjusted online, perfect for our application. The pay-as-you-go option is especially attractive given its low cost. With respect to text messages, I can receive up to 100 texts for about $11 a month and pay more only if needed. In order to test coverage for our field conditions, I constructed a simple prototype that could be triggered manually to send text messages to my work cell phone while I was in the field. The prototype was tested while visiting monitoring sites for routine field work. Of the 38 sites tested, we successfully transmitted text messages 
using the Arduino Fona hardware from 84% of the sites we visited. This suggested that the 2G network hosted by T-Mobile via Ting should suffice for application. We did run into issues at sample sites located in incised channels like this one. Obviously, these sites provide limited visibility to cell phone towers, but this can be easily overcome by extending wire from a sensor in the channel to a remote environmental monitor, or REM, located on a bank. Since the output pins on the Pro Trinket provide such little power, I was worried that attaching sensors through long lengths of wire might result in signal loss. But benchtop tests proved this wasn't an issue at all to be worried about for either 5 volt or 3 volt Pro Trinkets offered by Adafruit. Although texting data is useful, it would be much better if we could capture, store, and access environmental data through the Internet of Things. In support of this goal, I discovered a free and open platform known as ThingSpeak that allows me to monitor field conditions via a web browser. Rather than texting data from the phone to a cell phone, this platform allows me to post data continuously to the ThingSpeak server using minute amounts of cellular data. The data is stored for free and can be retrieved and reviewed from my office at my discretion. Because the bandwidth for these environmental data posts is so small, I can post approximately 5,000 data points to ThingSpeak over the course of a month for about $11 when using a Ting SIM card installed in the Fona. This is looking promising, but what about power? Well, commercial modems rely on auto samplers, which typically run on a lead acid battery. However, our samplers are simple standalone bottles, so I would need to power my system independently. In response, I investigated using a solar panel coupled with a solar LiPo charger offered by Adafruit and a small 4.3 volt 2000 milliamp hour LiPo battery for power. As wired in my prototype, the REM will run off its battery until the voltage drops to about 4 volts. At that time, the solar panel tops off the battery and the cycle repeats. I tested this in my backyard and used this as an opportunity to also test telemetry by posting battery voltage data to ThingSpeak using the Pro Trinket Phona setup, and it worked great. On one occasion, I blinded the REM from sunlight for two days with no impact on performance, suggesting that a cloudy day should not impact cellular telemetry. This looks really promising. Another option offered by commercial hardware is the ability to trigger remote attachments through a terminal program that can communicate over cellular networks. Although I have not tried this functionality, ThingSpeak does allow me to trigger reactions remotely via the Internet of Things. My colleague, Dr. Ron Tiller, also discovered an application known as ThingTweet, where the thresholds in ThingSpeak can be set for triggering tweets to a private account. This gives me the added benefit of being able to receive notifications on my cell phone without having to use text data for the same. This functionality has been successfully tested by Dr. Tiller although there can be delays of up to 30 minutes between a triggering event and notification via Twitter. Please review the documentation for ThingTweet app on the ThingSpeak website if you need further details. Although my bench tests were successful in posting battery voltage, temperature, and humidity data to ThingSpeak, I would still need to develop a sensor for determining when flow was witnessed at my first flush samplers. One thing I observed when collecting full bottles was soil moisture at depth in the soil profile next to the bottle, so I decided to investigate soil moisture sensors for detecting the same. Research on the web pointed me to gypsum blocks, which can be buried next to the bottle, thus providing a low-profile alternative that's protected from being physically disturbed by a flood. A gypsum block is essentially made up of two conductive wires encased in plaster of Paris. Voltage is applied to the wires, and the resistance produced by the block can be measured accordingly. When the gypsum block gets wet, a change in its resistance can be measured through what's known as a voltage divider circuit. The Arduino senses the state of the gypsum block, and that information is sent to ThingSpeak. In practice, the gypsum block will be placed adjacent to the sample bottle. When there's a flood, infiltration should result in the block becoming wet, with the resulting change in signal 
being registered by the Pro Trinket. Gypsum blocks can be made using Tigon tubing as a mold for a wet plaster of Paris into which you install two conductive pieces of metal. I started with nails but eventually settled on stainless steel wire hangers for my conductive metal. As such, these cost very little to make. Since these blocks may be saturated for some time, I tested their integrity by submerging them in water for five days. I was concerned the blocks would dissolve, but the blocks held up fine with almost no change in saturated resistance after day five. Finally, I was interested in seeing how the wetting drying profile of a gypsum block would be registered by the Pro Trinket. This graph shows the analog response of a gypsum block that has been saturated and then is allowed to dry over 10 hours. The curve demonstrates that a change in the moisture absorbed and released by the block does produce an appreciable change in the signal registered by my Pro Trinket when used in a voltage divider circuit. Although not necessary for my application, the shape of the curve can also help me determine when the block is considered wet and when it's starting to dry out completely. For my application, I decided to also add an inexpensive rain sensor, which can be had for about $1 on eBay. This sensor is mounted on the back of an Altoids box and will be attached adjacent to the box hosting my electronics. I added this more out of curiosity since rain at the site is not necessarily proof positive of flow in the wash. The last thing I needed to consider was the box itself. Since our site is exposed to the rain and sunlight, will my selected enclosure hold up to the elements? Will the enclosure get too hot? Temperature is particularly important since my electronics will only operate within a limited temperature range. To evaluate risks associated with high desert temperatures, I set up an Arduino Uno to log temperature to a data logger, wire the electronics to run off solar power, and then seal the data logger in my box. I then brought the enclosed electronics with me to the field during routine field work on a particularly hot day. This graph shows the temperature profile registered during the course of the day with the box in direct sunlight. You can see here that conditions in the box approached 140 degrees Fahrenheit. When comparing this to the published tolerances for my hardware, I realized I should not charge the LiPo battery at temperatures above 113 degrees Fahrenheit, since doing so could risk serious damage. Fortunately, the solar LiPo charger sold by Adafruit gives me the option of attaching a thermistor to my battery. The thermistor shuts down charging of the battery should it get too hot, thus addressing the concern. I'm not too worried about this anyway since charging is most likely to take place in the cooler morning hours after my battery has drained overnight. If you're wondering about that dip in the temperature profile that takes place at about uh, 12 in the afternoon, that reflects me bringing the box inside my vehicle for travel to another sample site and uh, it captures the fact that I had the AC on in the vehicle. So after about six months of tinkering, this shows our first remote environmental monitor ready for field deployment. For those of you interested in learning more about the components, wiring, and programming used for the first prototype, details are posted at the link available in the description of this video. Although this prototype was tested successfully in the field over the course of a year, we've since made some significant improvements in both the hardware and software which will soon be documented and shared via this channel. In my next chapter, I'll share some field performance metrics associated with this first prototype, lessons learned, and hardware software improvements resulting from our first year's test. Please consider subscribing for updates or notifications of when it's posted. More details are coming soon. Thanks for watching.